Well, good evening once again on this Sunday night online. So thankful that you would be able to join with us tonight. Had a wonderful day in spite of all the snow that we received last night. Had a wonderful day uh, with the Lord's people this morning and looking forward to getting into God's Word tonight. Look in your Bible, if you will, to Numbers 25. Numbers 25. And while you're turning there, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the backstory, and then I'm going to give you some principles tonight on our on our picture of courage. The backstory here is that Balaam was a a man from Midian who was sent to bring a curse upon Israel. And you'll remember the story of Balaam as he goes to uh, work at bringing this curse against Israel. Remember, the angel of the Lord stands in the way of his donkey, and his donkey wouldn't go, and, and Balaam beat the donkey. The donkey talked to him. He said, I, you know, why are you beating me? And so Balaam knew that he had to change his tactic. And so the long story short, and there's much more to it than this abbreviated version, but essentially God had laid out to Balaam all the blessings that he had for his people. And you're not going to be able to curse them. You can't pronounce a curse on them when I have blessed them. And so what Balaam does is Balaam, in, in a sense, gives his devious plan and has the women of Midian to seduce the men of Israel. And that would be a way to bring a curse upon Israel, to just get them to go into a defiance of God and them to bring a curse upon themselves. That's really what the whole issue was, is, is to get a curse on Israel by them bringing a curse upon themselves. Now, I want you to look, if you will, in Numbers chapter 25, and I want you to see this passage of scripture. Verse number one, and Israel abode in Shidom, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. That's the god of uh, these Moabites and the Midianites there. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the high priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 24,000. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel." Now, the name of the Israelite was, that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, the son of Salua, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman was slain was Cusbi, the daughter of Zur, who was head over a people and a chief house in Midian. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cusbi, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague of, for Peor's sake. Now we read all that text for this purpose. Balaam had floated the idea of there's no way 
that I can bring a curse against the people that God has blessed. But if we can seduce them into going into whoredoms and living in sin, they'll bring the curse upon themselves. And Israel was happy to oblige that. They began to do that. And God sent a plague among the Israelites because you guys are breaking my covenant with you. You're taking wives from other lands that I told you not to. You're defiling yourself. You're defiling the seed. And so God sent a plague among the people. And in fact, it got to the place where God told Moses, go get the heads of all the tribes and tell them to judge their own tribes and get their people in order. Hang them up if you have to, but we have to deal with this. And in the process of that, the people were grieving. People were grieving. The people of Israel were grieving over over the judgment, over the plague, over the people that died because of the plague, over the people that were dying because of being put to death in sin. And while they were all at the tabernacle, at the door of the congregation, grieving, Moses was there, Aaron was there, all of these men were there. Here comes this guy from the tribe of Simeon, who is one of the prince of the tribe. He's a head guy there. He's got a woman from the Midianites, she, her name there is Kuzbi, the daughter of Zur, who was a head over a people. So he's a chief in Midian. Then we have one of the chiefs of Simeon. He takes her and goes in with her in the camp. Now, up until this point, the men of Israel had been going out. They'd been worshiping Baal Peor. They'd been engaging in immoral acts and fornication, and whoredoms, the Bible says, outside the camp. But now this man brazenly, in front of everybody, brings Kuzby into the camp to go in with her. And Phineas says, no way. He jumps up, takes a javelin in his hand, goes in, puts them both to death. And immediately the plague is stayed from Israel. And God gives a blessing, an eternal blessing, upon Phineas, a covenant of peace, in an everlasting priesthood in Israel. It's, it is quite the story. But I want us to think about this guy, Phineas, and what God was really doing here and teaching here with his life. Oh, I want you to go back with me very quickly. Hold your finger there in Numbers. But go back with me to Psalm 106. Psalm 106. And this is a, a little psalm of a recap of what happened there look in verse number eight nevertheless now verse verse number verse number six psalm 106 verse six we have sinned with our fathers we have committed iniquity we have done wickedly our fathers understood not the wonders in egypt they remembered not the multitude of thy mercies but provoked him at the sea even at the red sea nevertheless he saved them for his name's sake that he might uh make his mighty power to be known. And he goes on and talks about how God had done all these great things. Verse, verse 13, they soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Notice in verse number 16, uh, they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. The earth opened up and swallowed Dothan and covered the company of Abiram. And Notice, uh, all these things happened to them. Verse number 24, yet they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. They murmured in the tents. They hearkened not to the voice of God. Verse number 28, they joined themselves also unto Baal Peor. Here's the story we're at in Numbers 25. And ate the sacrifices of the dead. So this was a, a very pagan, satanic ritual that they were doing. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and the plague break in upon them. Then stood up Phineas and executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. And that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. And we could go on and on, but here it's mentioned in the book of Psalms, the act that Phineas had. Now, this was a courageous act. Moses didn't do it. Aaron didn't do it. Eliezer didn't do it, but his son Phineas, Aaron's grandson, got up, took a spear, put it through this man and this woman, and put an end to the plague. Now, this is a great act of courage, and I'll tell you why. Because even though this is an actual story from the Old Testament, 
it has a great implication for us in the New Testament because it's going to teach us really two great lessons. Number one, it's going to teach us how to deal with sin in our own lives. Sin is so deceptive. Sin eventually, sin first starts outside the camp. It starts out somewhere in a place hidden. But before long, it grows into a brazen act of rebellion before God. Sin has that effect. It's usually out in the dark, but then it comes into the light. It's usually out hidden and covered, and then eventually it comes in to uh, the open. And sin is so destructive and so deceptive. And here it was in the life of the children of Israel, it had come into the camp. And can I tell you that sin is so so much that way in our own lives. Maybe we have some sin in the exterior parts of our lives and, and we go to it and we, we seek it out. But I will tell you this, if you don't deal with it, eventually it comes into the very core of your life and it will blazingly, uh, right before God and everybody, sin will have its way with your life. And this is what Phineas did. Phineas put, he put that thing to death. Now, this was a sin that was going to be done in the sight of God, in the sight of Moses, in the sight of the priests, right in front of the whole camp. They had, he had invited these people to do their sacrifices unto their gods and then commit this heinous act in front of God and everybody. And Phineas would not have that. So he went out and took care of the situation with a sword. Now, listen to me. Sin is the enemy of holiness. It is the opposite of holiness. God is holy. And when he saved us, he saved us to be holy. He wants us to offer our bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, holy, which is your reasonable service. Jesus told us to live holy. Be ye holy as I am holy in all manner of conversation. That's the command for God's people. God desires for us to live in holiness, to live in righteousness, to, to not allow sin to reign in our mortal bodies. We, we have to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Mortify means to put to death, to do what Phineas did in that act, to put those two to death. That's what we are to do to sin in our own lives. Listen, I, I heard a statement many years ago that said, treat sin today like sin will treat you tomorrow. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So what do we do with sin? We treat sin today like it's going to treat us tomorrow. We put it to death. This is what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 5. Remember, the, remember when Jesus said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. He, he was not talking about self-mutilation. He was talking about something far greater than that. He was talking about self-crucifixion, dying to self, crucifying your flesh and mortifying the deeds of your old man. You know, we've, we've gotten away from this understanding of dying to self and putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Listen, the Lord doesn't want us just to cut our physical hand off. He wants us to crucify that hand in the victory that Jesus has given us and put it to death. And I will tell you, many Christians do not live a crucified life. Paul said, I die daily. Uh, Paul, but you're living right now. Yes, but I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, that the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul understood the power of the crucified life. Uh, Paul said to the uh, churches of Galatia, and uh, I, want you to, I want you to think about this. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul had just told them, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of their flesh. Now they were being told that they needed to uh, go under circumcision. These Gentile believers were being told that they had to be circumcised. And Paul was telling them, look, you cannot be made perfect by just cutting off uh, parts of your flesh or your body. You, you do this, you can live holy by crucifying your old nature. So he says in verse 16 of Galatians 5, 
walk in the spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusteth or warreth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These can, are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you led, if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Then he says, the works of the flesh are made manifest, adultery, fornication, so forth. But the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and so forth. Now watch this, verse 24. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So Paul was simply saying this, those that are of Christ have crucified the flesh. Let me tell you about the crucified life. When you saw a man in Bible days carrying a Roman cross, there's a couple things you knew. Number one, he was not coming home. You knew that man was not coming home. That he was going one way, and that was to die. And number two, you knew that that death was going to be painful. It was going to be painful. Not only that, it was going to be pitiless. Nobody had pity on a crucified man. When Jesus was dying, they sat down and they watched him. They wagged their heads. They spit in his face. They threw curses into his teeth. They, they had no pity on him. And it was permanent. When you died on the cross, you were there until you died. There was no, there was no swooning. There was no bringing a man down before he died. No, nope, you, you waited. If he didn't die on his own, you broke his legs or you pierced him in the side. You did whatever you had to do to put that man to a permanent death. And can I tell you, church, this is what we need to do. Phineas shows us the courage that we ought to have about sin in our own lives. Number one, we ought to put it to death. Have no pity on sin in your life. Have no pet sin. Have no favorite sin. Have no sin that we hide and we cater to. We need to put sin to death for sin will put us to death. One old preacher said too many Christians treat sin like a, like a cream puff when we ought to treat it like a rattlesnake. And we, we need to put it to death. And so Phineas teaches us how to deal with sin in our own lives. But not only that, he tells us how to deal with sin within the congregation of God's people, within the church. You know, the Bible tells us that we are to deal with sin in the church. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We're not to have fellowship with darkness. We're to put out those things that, that break the fellowship within the church. The man who is committing sin in the church of Corinth Paul said, you got to put him out. You put him out. Uh, you you got to learn to turn him over to uh, the devil for the destruction of his flesh if he will not get right with God. We have to deal with sin in our own lives and in our, our church. And, and this is what the Bible says about Phineas that was to his credit. God said he awarded him because he was zealous for the Lord. Now, there's a word that rhymes with zealous that we see throughout the scripture that really this is talking about. The zeal of the Lord had made him jealous for God. Zealous for God is to be jealous for God. When this man, Phineas, saw this chief head of the tribe of Simeon committing this kind of sin before God, it so grieved his heart because he loved God, he loved his holiness, and he so had a heart for God that he knew that this was against God and it broke his heart. And so he had a responsibility to speak out against it and to confront it. We need to be able to confront anything that would threaten our church family. Any kind of sin that would threaten our church family, we need to make sure that we deal with it biblically and appropriately. And we need to do it the right way, with the right attitude, with the right spirit. But I'll tell you what this is. This is not just calling people to a ministry of confrontation. It's calling people to a ministry of holiness and zealousness for God. We ought to be zealous for God and we should be able to look for things in our own lives and within the church that would be sinful behavior that would, that would break the fellowship or the blessing or quench the spirit of God in the church. Uh, the Bible tells us that we are to re reprove one another, exhort one another, rebuke one another. Listen, if we see sin in another believer's life, let me tell you what the Bible says. You go to them alone. You don't spread it around. That just adds sin to sin. You go to them alone 
and you talk with them and you pray with them and you take the time necessary to make that thing right. And over time, if they won't hear you, this is not an immediate process. It's, it's, it, you have to follow the leading of the Spirit of God, but if they don't hear you, then you, you take a couple of other trusted uh, believers with you that can go and pray and help this person. And, 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 and listen, I'm simply saying this. We need to make sure that we have such a love for the Lord that we, we would want to get rid of anything in our own lives or in our fellowship that would hinder him or grieve him, giving no place to the devil, giving no place to sin, and that we would root it all out. Uh, just like a gardener who loves his garden hates weeds, and he'll go out there and pull weeds the first sign of a weed. That's how we have to deal with sin in our lives. That's how we have to deal with sin when we see it in the body of believers. Let nothing, let nothing take root and become a canker and eat through the body and cause an infection to the body. But let's keep things clean before God. You know, Phineas was a man who didn't just hate sin. He was a man who loved God. And that's the difference. I know a lot of Christians who, boy, they're good at finding sin and fault in every other people. But they don't love God. And they're harsh, not holy. They're mean, not merciful. Uh, but a merciful man... Listen, if I, if I told you tonight that, that I knew of a, a young child who did not want to be taken from her home, but was taken from her home against her will, taken to a building filled with strangers and was taken into a place isolated from everyone else, and there a man took a sharp blade and pierced it into her, you'd think, oh, what a terrible thing. But if I told you that the girl was not wanting to leave her home, she was sick and she was in pain and she didn't want to go. But a doctor came and got her and they took her, even against her will, but they took her to the hospital and took her down into an emergency room where no one else could go but those that were qualified. And a doctor took a scalpel and put it into her and opened her up to cut out the infection, to get out that, that uh, infected appendix or whatever it might be. Well, then you'd say, well, that's an act of mercy. Well, sure. You see, there's a difference between treating others harshly and treating others with holiness before God. Uh, there, is a, there is a speaking the truth in love. There is a way to deal with things to where it, it treats the infection. It he heals the patient. It doesn't, doesn't just kill, but it heals the patient. And it puts a death to the infection. That's what Phineas did. And that's what you and I need to do in our own lives. And we need to watch for within the body. For a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, a little sin defileth the whole thing. And we need to be in love with the Lord, jealous for the Lord, jealous for his people and for his church. And over our own lives as well, jealous for God to not let anything come in and destroy the fellowship that we have with the Lord. And we need to have that courage that Phineas had to deal with it immediately, abruptly, and completely. And then it will stay the hand of God's plague and it'll bring God's blessing into our lives. What a great act of courage Phineas had. Lord, thank you for this story. Boy, on the outside, it looks brutal and vicious. But Lord, when you really pull back the layers and you see what sin was doing to the people, what an act of mercy Phineas had. And Lord, this is how we need to treat sin in our own lives. Speak to our heart tonight. Help us to follow your word in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.